This is The Enrage, a show where we take a deeper dive into written works published at the Center for a Stateless Society. Join us as we give voice to the ideas challenging the vain phantoms that haunt our social reality and stand in the way of total liberation. For more information, visit c4ss.org. And to support this show or any of the other projects happening at the center, please visit patreon.com slash c4ss.org. Thank you for listening. Hello, and thank you for tuning in to The Yon Roger. I'm your host, Joel Williamson. Today we'll be joined by a distinguished professor of law and business ethics at La Sierra University and senior fellow of the Center for a Stateless Society, Gary Chartier, to discuss the left libertarian classic, Libertarians for Redistribution. Gary Chartier, welcome to the show. Great to be here, Joel. So you start out the article strong with these words, libertarianism is a redistributive project. That's another way in which radical market anarchism is rightly seen as part of the socialist tradition. You wrote that back in 2010, I believe. Sounds right. Do you still agree with the basic underlying arguments that you made in the article? So I draw on the article and expand it a bit in my book, Anarchy and Legal Order, which is a couple of years later. And I think the vast majority of the things I say in most chapters of that book, uh, I'd endorse. I think that I have been prompted over time by friends with experiences of other parts of the world to wonder whether I was naive in thinking that the word socialist can be used without suggesting to too many people Uh, say, the uh, inequities of, you know, Iron Curtain era, Eastern Europe, uh, and so forth. I think friends from that part of the world, certainly at any rate, are are often uncomfortable with that language because of the way they've been accustomed to its being used. So I'm a fan of uh, the uh, Benjamin Tucker era U.S. individualist anarchists. And of course, Tucker famously uh, wanted to talk about himself and his colleagues as part of the socialist tradition, and I want to cheer for their doing so, I'd probably be a little hesitant about that language now because of the way in which I've kind of realized over time it affects real people who have experienced realities labeled in that way. But I think the general point of the article that a radical market anarchism can be helpfully understood by looking at it through the lens of redistribution. Uh, Yeah, I think that's certainly right. It seems to me that it really is the case that that provocative way of putting the matter allows us to group together some important aspects of radical left market anarchism in a way that can be quite illuminating. At risk of this being an overly simple question, uh, just to get everyone sort of on the same page, How do you define distribution and redistribution? You know, so the article for people who have not read it, and maybe that's the place to start, Libertarians for Redistribution, the article, again, is intended to be deliberately provocative. When most of us hear the term redistribution, if we're not perhaps uh, steeped in conversations shaped by work like this, What we tend to think of is something like the state making a judgment about what an ideal allocation of resources would be using whatever uh, sort of distributive principle it takes to be appropriate and taking steps then to parcel out those resources from the center to uh, those it takes to be appropriately entitled to them. And so redistribution suggests that we have Uh, some other set of processes in virtue of which particular assets get into particular people's hands and that the state then steps back or some other, you know, wouldn't have to be the state. You can imagine some, you know, some non-state entity uh, taking the same uh, position as long as it used, used force might not qualify as a state because it might not have the level of control or systematic involvement in people's lives that a state does. But uh, in any event, uh, for simplicity's sake, we can talk about the state. 
the state takes a step back and says, what would be a good way for all of these assets to be parceled out? They've been uh, distributed uh, using uh, some other mechanism. And obviously, uh, what that mechanism is is a different matter. We're going to redistribute them to those who should have them. So when people hear the word redistribution, they often think about forcible reallocation of assets using some conception of what would be a good pattern of distribution. And Obviously, I think that's an understanding of redistribution that doesn't work from the standpoint of uh, certainly of radical market anarchism. I think the statist approach often assumes that uh, today the, the earlier pattern of distribution the state seeks to interrupt and, as it were, redo is a market-based one because these conversations typically happen in societies uh, in which uh, there are supposed to be markets. Though, of course, you could have redistributive policies put in place, uh, say, in something like Ancien Régime France, in which uh, clearly markets are not the primary driving force of uh, distribution at all. What I want to try to do in the article is to question those assumptions about uh, you know how we might think about the existing pattern of distribution and implicitly nudge people to think about the way in which instead that existing pattern of distribution is not you know the product of anything like unfettered consensual exchanges but rather is itself the product of, of state intervention and then the redistrib- redistributive activity they want to talk about is not a matter then of the state fixing this problem because the state, in fact, caused the problem, right? And so uh, what I want to suggest is, is a range of rule changes in the interests of justice and uh, then action within those rules and, and so forth. So the, the point of the article is to get us to rethink how we might understand the dynamics of the economy and what it might take to fix injustices in that economy. I'm not really focused on defining distribution and redistribution so much as I am prompting people to question their assumptions about what the problems are and how to fix them. Most people, it seems, aren't really aware of the ways in which the state plays a role in redistribution. For instance, The status right, as you point out in the article, can be generalized as supporting the status quo and thus the ongoing redistributive upward transfer of wealth. And many on the authoritarian left are supportive of redistribution as well, but stand in contrast to conservatives by embracing a downward transfer of wealth. You point out in the piece that one thing both camps have in common are the means by which the redistribution takes place, namely the state. So let's say we can't actually achieve libertarian redistribution. Given a choice between these two options, which of these two schemes do you view as being more in line with what you believe? I'm I'm resistant to to that question because I feel like I'm being asked which of your legs do you want me to cut off? <laughs> Obviously, there are some people on the statist left and on the kind of non-market, non-statist left who are fundamentally anti-authoritarian and socially liberal people whose views I uh, you know, regard with a lot of affection, even if I don't share uh, their economic convictions. But I think the, as you said, the authoritarian left, that was the group you were talking about, which is the group that tends to want to embrace state power most enthusiastically, you know, is uh, obviously problematic precisely because it's authoritarian. And also, depending on, you know, where you draw the bounds as regards who counts in the authoritarian left, you're only talking about the authoritarian left and the authoritarian right. Maybe you want to say that people I'm thinking of are really the authoritarian center, but I think there certainly are lots of people who obviously, while they identify themselves as somehow on the left, are there pumping resources precisely not into those who've been deprived by the state, but rather into a particular set of cronies, right? So I'm suspicious of the notion that because we hear language about corrective, egalitarian redistribution on the part of one set of people, that that's in fact what's likely to happen as a result of their actual policy choices. 
So obviously, if the choice is between social conservatives who like hierarchy and people on the left who want a uh, richly complex, diverse society in which you know, we aren't, uh, you know, ruled by awful uh, tyrants of various sorts. You know, three cheers for those folks on the left. But I think we then have to go on and ask whether the variety of leftist politics that I'd associate with radical market anarchism can turn a blind eye to the really obnoxious behavior of the authoritarian uh, regimes that cloak themselves in leftist uh, garb. So I'm hesitant to jump on board with either of those uh, alternatives. I guess that's my, my bottom line. On the topic of statist redistribution, you note that, quote, they may also, of course, shift resources to the economically vulnerable, but the prime beneficiaries of these programs are various groups of politically influential people. Can you expound on what that means and is this outcome always and necessarily the case with statist redistribution? Yeah, so is it metaphysically necessary? Probably not, right? I mean, I'm sure we can, uh, uh, I'm sure there are possible worlds in which it doesn't happen, though I think those possible worlds are quite different from, from the actual world. So I, I'd say there are two kinds of things that I have in mind there. So first of all, the obvious point is I think that there is not a big, powerful lobby uh, made up of single moms on public assistance, right? I think you sometimes get the impression when you listen to, you know, right-wing cranks that there are, um, you know, the our equivalent of the sans uh, you know, rallying in the streets constantly and the uh, politicians who seek to pander to them are throwing lots of money at them. And I just don't think that accurately describes the world we live in, right? The people, the people who are economically vulnerable are on the outs politically, and that's, I think, uh, unsurprising. And so when there does seem to be some kind of mechanism that perhaps quite imperfectly confers some benefit on economically vulnerable people, I think we can safely assume that other people are pushing for the program that's benefited them. And while undoubtedly there are morally serious, well-intentioned activists who are among those pushing for these programs, uh, the odds that those morally serious, well-intentioned activists are, as a general matter, the people who are influential you know, in the various state houses and on Capitol Hill strikes me as very, very uh, low. I just think those odds are, are very low. So it seems to me that when we have programs that are embraced by politicians, I begin with the assumption that they're embraced by politicians for the reason that the majority of politicians embrace programs, namely that doing so is politically beneficial to them. And political benefit to them is very often a matter, of course, of benefit to some group of which they're part or benefit to their their cronies who may pass on benefits to them and, and so forth. I mean, benefits don't have to be immediately tangible and material, though sometimes they are. But, uh, you know, politicians have, it seems to me, very often pretty predictable sets of motivations, and uh, we shouldn't be surprised if they, they act on those motivations. So the first thing I'm trying to get at in that uh, maybe overly tight formulation is that we often have a kind of spillover effect of policies that are adopted because they are to the advantage of particular elite groups or otherwise politically influential groups that turn out to be beneficial to some economically vulnerable people. So I think the point that's been made uh, repeatedly, and I think you'd find this on the part of, uh, say, of Marxist analysts uh, as much as, as libertarians, is that the practical effect of ameliorative programs of various kinds is often from the standpoint of uh, elite groups that it minimizes social unrest, right? It's a, a source of protection against the instability that might result if various groups currently excluded from, uh, you know, access to resources and so forth were, were to become so restive that uh, perhaps they really were out there in the streets. Uh, so I think that's, that's part of what's going on. Um, again, 
I don't think you can have a single variable explanation uh, for anything. And so, you know, what I've said to date may, uh, in focusing particularly on elite mischief and politicians' responsiveness to that and participation in it, be unduly simplistic, you know, because I'm quite sure also that you have politicians who feel good about themselves because they think, uh, you know, we live uh, certainly in the U.S. and in uh, other uh, countries in the global north. We live with uh, a level of prosperity that means that, of course, we can acquire some of that. The state can acquire some of that by taxes and dish it out and pass it on to, to various vulnerable people. And they certainly might do that for that reason. So we don't want to suggest perhaps the language I used in the article was unduly kind of unequivocal in the way that I talked about things, because undoubtedly state uh, programs can, uh, can be uh, sometimes embraced by people trying to do good. I think, again, we should be aware of the degree to which there's a bootleggers and Baptist dynamic here, and that uh, indeed, uh, even though there are some people who uh, are uh, genuinely virtuous and pushing for things, there are going to be other people who see benefits to the politically well-connected who want to pursue them in that way. I mean, so to think about a simple example here, (laughs) because the devil is always in the details in something this complicated. I mean, you think about the way in which a U.S. government food program can serve as a means of funneling resources to farmers, you know, to agribusiness uh, companies, let's say, that are, uh, you know, supplying uh, things that uh, turn out to be uh, distinctively purchasable, let's say, with a particular uh, set of resources allocated to uh, you know, food support. So, you know, it's always more complicated in that way. And I guess that's really the, the kind of thing I want to emphasize. I also want to emphasize that, you know, we don't want, I think, to fall into a, a model of in some way blaming the victim. I think we also have to note the difference between the kind of mutual aid programs that I talk about in the article, as you rightly note, what I call solidaristic redistribution is another way of looking at what we might call mutual aid, I think those programs have different effects on the beneficiaries, I think, often than do state redistributive programs. So we might imagine, say, the cleanest sort of state redistributive program being a basic income scheme that's, uh, you know, much less market distorting, much less bureaucratically complex than a variety of uh, more targeted uh, means-tested programs. And if the only thing the state did were to deliver a basic income scheme, I think we'd have reason to, to know problems with that, but it certainly would be far less troubling than many of the other things the state does. Having said that, I do think we ought to at least ask questions about the way in which even a program like that in the imagined world in which that's the only thing the state does, you know, can in one way or another prove in the end of the day problematic precisely for the recipients. And therefore, I guess that's another angle, another wrinkle I'd want to point to in making that I do in the article. But the the bottom line, I think, is that we should be aware of elite mischief. We should assume that elites will take advantage of uh, programs that are framed in virtuous terms to, uh, to benefit themselves and their cronies. Not that that's the only thing that happens, but that that's a consistent dimension of what's going on with respect to these kinds of programs. So that's, uh, I, again, I think I would nuance a bit what I said just to avoid appearing to make a claim that such and such is always and only the case. That's, I think, probably always wrong in talking about social phenomena. But I think we can certainly talk about a a trend or a pattern that we ought to be concerned by. In what way does libertarian redistribution take into account relevant concerns surrounding who, what, and how? And how does it stand apart from the mainstream? As I I mentioned at, at the beginning in trying to kind of frame this article... I think what I was trying to do in the article, and certainly in my reuse of that material in Anarchy and Legal Order, was to highlight the radical character of market anarchism and to emphasize that the kinds of concerns that might prompt a, you know, a decent person to contemplate the potential merits of state redistribution those considerations should lead someone to acknowledge the value of the kind of redistribution I argue for 
in the article. And so, of course, as you've already noted, I think implicitly by the way you've, you've talked about this, there's a heterogeneous group of items here, right? So there is redistribution that really is a kind of rectification, right? So there is stuff that's been misappropriated and that can reasonably be returned to the victims. Then there's there's another kind of kind of broadly rectificatory redistribution, uh, which involves, as it were, treating some kinds of ill-gotten gains as so ill-gotten and so tied up with ongoing mischief that there's no way that they should be uh, treated as legitimate possessions of you know the state or its cronies, and so again, it's a matter there of, of of sort of throwing those things open for for homesteading in one way or another. Then there's a matter of, as I say, I've talked about solidaristic redistribution, in which a redistribution turns out to be uh, in part affected precisely by the choices of particular people to re- redistribute to share resources uh, with others. There's also the kind of redistribution that happens when bad rules, rules that rig markets in one way or another are eliminated. And so when that happens, on the one hand, uh, resources dry up to one degree or another for those who have benefited from those unjust uh, rigging rules. And on the other hand, uh, resources uh, make their way now into the hands of people who were previously disfranchised in one way or another and now are able to to benefit. So, I mean, I think you've got a range of different things going on under the heading of redistribution. And I don't I don't think there's a single kind of uh, who, what, why, where, how answer there, right? Uh, it, you know, it seems to me instead that what we've got are different ways in which resources change hands in response to various kinds of uh, of bad things, right? I mean, they can be direct injustices that are being rectified or, uh, you know, as in the case of solidaristic redistribution, you know, you might be talking about a response to injustice or just to, you know, to accident or, or bad luck. But again, uh, the idea being still that people are redistributing. It occurs to me, I hadn't thought about this before, and I don't think I referenced it in the article. It occurs to me that I probably talked about even solidaristic redistribution as a kind of redistribution because of my engagement with the work of the philosopher John Finnis, who has a very extended and sophisticated discussion of property rights in the broadly speaking, Aristotelian uh, Thomas tradition. And I, there are various ways in which my own approach, which kind of builds on Finnis's, differs from his. And so what I'm about to describe is not exactly what I would want to say, but I, it explains, I think, why I'd want to talk this way. So Finnis is responding to the view of people like Bob Nozick, who, uh, you know, question the authority of the state to intervene and uh, and redistribute uh, resources for various reasons, say, through the tax system. And Finna says, well, but let's not even think about it in those terms. You know, bracket the question of what the state can do. Uh, let's just talk about individuals. And he, he then goes on to argue that he thinks individuals have certain redistributive duties. And if they don't fulfill those duties, then all the state is doing is getting to do what they should be obligated, what they're obligated to do in the first place. Now, I think that's that's a bit complicated for more than one reason, not least because just because I'm obligated to do something, it doesn't follow that anytime that's the case, the state is therefore necessarily entitled to make me do it, even you know, bracketing the question of anarchism. But I think it was the idea that redistributive duties are there, you know, for individuals uh, for Finnis that probably made me think, okay, so the language of redistribution can be used, you know, in connection with what I've called solidaristic redistribution, just as in other cases. So your question suggested maybe there was a kind of unifying answer to be given, a kind of tight, narrow theory of libertarian redistribution. And I'm not sure that's the case. Rather, I think libertarian redistribution, as I conceive it in the article, is an umbrella term for a variety of ways in which the um, changing hands of resources turns out to respond in one way or another to problematic features of, of our social environment.
And I'd like to further explore some of the types of libertarian redistribution that you mentioned just now and also in the article. Most people are probably not familiar with how freed markets could act in a redistributive manner. Beyond what you've already said about this process, could you break down what transactional redistribution is and how it works? Yeah, sure. So let's think about the range of state interventions in the market and think about, for instance, say, occupational licensure, just to take that as an obvious example. Well, you know, look, let's, let's take a particularly extreme example because it involves a lot of, a lot of resources, right? The, think about medical care. So the, the way in which not just physicians, but everybody from physical therapists to occupational therapists to uh, dentists, people throughout the, the broad medical care sector benefit from licensing requirements that limit the provision of various kinds of services that many people want very badly to those people with state permission slips. And at the same time, of course, it's not just those individuals. Uh, think about the way in which uh, hospital operation via certificate of need requirements uh, gets limited in this way. Hospital accreditation uh, turns out to uh, affect, I think, you know, state uh, policies in one way or another. The um, way in which, say, medical devices and drugs are uh, accessible only via approved channels uh, that are affected by intellectual property rules. So you think about that whole host of ways in which various groups that are privileged in virtue of these licensing or IP or you know, certificate of need or accreditation requirements or, or other things, these groups then get, in the economist's sense, substantial rents. Right, they get uh, you know tremendous benefits that come because they have this legal privilege of being gatekeepers. They get to erect toll gates. To use an, an oft used uh, employ, oft used example here, and so people have to go through those toll gates to get access to various services, and therefore uh, have to pay uh, a premium, uh, as it were, to go through the toll gate. So you have here a kind of state-driven redistributive process that on the one hand takes resources from ordinary people who wouldn't otherwise uh, spend, the, spend these resources by using force to preclude their accessing alternatives. And on the other hand, then, these resources flow in predictable, uh, you know, large quantities to those who get to operate the toll gates. So if you imagine then a genuinely uh, freed or liberated market, then you imagine one in which those toll gates have been demolished. And so as a result, on the one hand, there is in effect a redistribution away from those who maintained wealth because they operated the toll gates. And then there, there is a redistribution to both the consumer, because the consumer is not spending as much as we know whenever we encounter a monopoly situation. Unsurprisingly, there are, you know, prices go up and the consumer uh, is dunned as a result. And also there's a redistribution to other providers who might, uh, you know, otherwise have gained some of these resources were they not excluded, right? So you think about say, the number of day-to-day -day ordinary healthcare benefits that could be conferred by nurses or nurse practitioners that instead we have to get from physicians. And the point, of course, is not that there isn't genuine specialist knowledge and skill on the part of physicians, and we'd certainly expect that to persist in a free market. The point is that consumers would have a broader range of choices about where to go for the services that they now uh, really have no choice but to get from uh, physicians. And so I think freeing the market then would be a way, on the one hand, of removing uh, resources, you know, really unjustly acquired by those with various kinds of state secured privileges, and on the other hand, providing those resources in bulk to consumers who then get to spend them as they preferred rather than having to continue investing them in very high priced services and also again to 
some lower cost service providers who are prevented from competing with the privileged by the state. And so obviously, this isn't a matter of the free market, as it were, coming in overnight and sweeping through people's bank accounts. It's not to redistributing the way the state redistributes, but it's just the case that on an ongoing basis, people simply wouldn't be able to maintain the kinds of incomes they could if they had state-secured privileges, it seems to me in many cases, and then certainly others would benefit in ways that they haven't now because of the greater options available to consumers. I believe the question before the one you just answered, you mentioned rectification or redistribution. Yeah. And on the topic... In the article, you wrote, quote, it is obviously not possible to correct all historical injustices, but when those injustices have systematically benefited some identifiable groups at the expense of others, radical correction is possible and entirely warranted. In your opinion, because you're a a law professor, in your opinion, what standard would need to be met in order to justify reappropriation. And without state courts, who would be deciding such edicts? Yeah. So it seems to me that rectification is a task of any good legal system. That is to say, people in one way or another unjustly interfere with and misappropriate the assets of others on an ongoing basis. And uh, while states make it easier for that to happen, states obviously aren't the only uh, means by which it happens. And so we certainly, I think, have to assume that any just legal system would be one in which various kinds of misappropriation of others' resources, others' possessions, could reasonably be dealt with. So, presuming we've got a functioning non state legal system, then I think the answer, who would do this if there aren't state courts, is the kind of legal system we'd want anyway in a stateless society. That business of rectification is really basic to what I think any court system is going to do. So the point is, we're talking here, it seems to me, about maybe two issues that make the kind of rectification I think would, would be reasonable special. Two kinds of issues. First of all, that you know, we're talking about often large scale issues rather than uh, simply one on one issues. Not necessarily uh, the case. I mean, you can certainly talk about the, the individual uh, cases too. But, and the, the other issue obviously is time. And so when we've had, you know, mass theft of resources and the state has been responsible for this, then of course the state courts will not have provided remedies. And so as a result, you know, you can't, for instance, say, well, the statute of limitations is told. So I think the statute of limitations in a case of this kind can only begin to toll once there's actually the possibility of rectification on the table. And until that happens, uh, the state has in effect stopped the clock by refusing to even contemplate addressing the kind of injustice that uh, has taken place. And so What I think happens at that point, it seems to me, is a matter when we're talking about actual rectification. So there are a couple of other kinds of issues uh, that I want to separate out from rectification that I'll talk about in a second. We're talking about actual rectification. We're talking about a case where there is an identifiable victim and an identifiable victimizer. You know, now obviously that doesn't necessarily mean that the state official who approved the theft of the land or the occupier of the stolen land, those people may not be around. But for actual rectification to take place, I think we're talking about a, a situation in which I can show that, let's say, my tribal community was evicted from uh, from this land by force, perhaps because it was just better land that other people wanted, and so we were shoved onto crummy not very fertile land, and the fertile land we had occupied was uh, taken over by uh, these other people, I can point to a clear sort of chain that links me with predecessors in in interest who occupied the land. And so I can say, here here are folks occupying the land now in some way justly, and that has to be 
dealt with. So I want to distinguish that kind of case where there's a clear victim with title to a particular asset that that person or a group that that person's part of should receive injustice versus a case in which we think of a couple of other possibilities. So again, there's a kind of rectification that comes when what has happened has just been large scale theft, not of individual identifiable things, pieces of land, most obviously, but rather of money. And the money has then been handed over to state cronies in one way or another, or embedded in particular assets. And so here I'm thinking about the kind of thing I talked about in the article that Murray Rothbard discusses in what is surely the kind of high point of his lefty phase in the 60s, the essay confiscation of the homestead principle, in which he talks about the way in which assets that have in fact come to embody stolen resources in large quantities may not have, if we're talking about resources just tax funded, assets that are just supported by the tax system. There's no individual who can be seen as uh, directly responsible. I suppose another alternative to the one Rothbard considers is that somehow you sell off the asset and people get a 32 cent tax refund. But I don't have a profound burden for for one uh, approach, but I think obviously the idea is that we shouldn't treat these assets the same way we treat genuinely, even if in some compromised way, private assets, we're talking instead about assets that are visible products of large-scale theft. And so Rothbard therefore envisions institutions that look this way being, as it were, opened up uh, either for homesteading by specific groups. You might, I think, suggest we want to treat, say, a, a state university or a a private university that's deeply, deeply state-funded as uh, open for, you know, some kind of uh, combined homesteading by the workers and the students. And you might imagine uh, that kind of thing happening elsewhere or kind of more large, you know, kind of wide open homesteading, Uh, thus the expression, the homestead principle, you know, something can be treated as unowned and just right for homesteading. And presumably often the people who are there on the ground are going to be the most able to take advantage of that, but I suppose others might too. So that's a different kind of case because while it's intended to rectify uh, the injustice of large-scale uh, state theft, there aren't kind of identifiable victims. So then there's a kind of, then there's a further uh, kind of complication, and I think it's it's less clear still how you deal with some of this. And this is the kind of injustice that's done not by stealing resources and using them to feed cronies or stealing land and transferring it to cronies, but by engrossing land and keeping it out of circulation and therefore denying people opportunities for their own uh, homesteading activities. And so obviously you think about, as uh, Kevin Carson points out in in his great uh, 2008 essay, The Subsidy of History, after the Civil War, I mean, sorry, the Revolutionary War, Uh, The Continental Congress engrosses something like, I think I've got the numbers right here, 200,000 acres and uh, gives those to George Washington. And Washington then, I think, hangs on to half himself and then parcels out the other 100,000, well, to veterans. That's what he was supposed to do. But the question, of course, is which veterans? And the answer is the veterans who were on his staff, his his buddies, uh, seem to get the, the lion's share here. And Washington's own career as a, quote, surveyor before the war, uh, I take it, is primarily uh, a career that happens because he's a land speculator. And uh, so he's looking forward then. So he gets the asset for nothing, in effect, and then is able to sell it off very much at a profit. We think about the various places around the U.S. in which there's land that might well be homesteaded in ways that would then uh, open up Housing opportunities make them make housing much less expensive. We know housing gobbles up so much of many people's uh, budgets, but this doesn't happen often because land has simply been held out of circulation in one way or another by uh, either a federal government action or state government action. And so obviously, you know, where this is still the case, then you certainly want to open that up for, for homesteading. Where it's happened and cronies in one way or another have benefited, there obviously that's more complicated. It's not the case that 
the resources were were stolen, if the land was opened up, let's say for bidding at levels that were artific- you know, artificially high uh, because of the way the state handled things, then it seems to me probably not a whole lot you can do about that now. If the land was, as in the case of Washington, just handed off, you'd like to do something there. You know, if you think about the land that went to, from Washington to those he sold it to, there probably, again, you may be unable to do much, but you certainly can do something when the engrossed land continues to be held out of circulation in ways that are, that are you know, beneficial, uh, certainly not to the ordinary people who might be able to benefit from it. So anyway, I guess all I'm trying to emphasize is that there are different kinds of inequities to rectify. Identifiable theft can be rectified by returning you know, resources to demonstrated owners, where theft uh, through the tax system requires a different kind of response and theft through engrossment and prevention of circulation, uh, perhaps yet another kind. Right. So you mentioned two things there. One is chattel slavery in the American South, and the second is land and the legacy of land theft and land monopoly. In the context of chattel slavery, speaking of Kevin Carson also, I could be wrong, but I interpret his position to be that corrective state action, when they've caused a problem, is basically legitimate. Now, I don't want to summarize what he believes, but that's my read of his position. In the context of chattel slavery in America, since we don't have an anarchist legal system that exists right now, how do you feel about this state rectifying the situation? Yeah, you know, so clearly, I think Rothbard was right that enslaved persons, when they were liberated, were undoubtedly entitled to compensatory access to at least some of the land they had been working while enslaved. And that should have happened immediately at the time. Uh, what we, of course, saw in, instead was the creation of the sharecropper system together with lawful legal restraints that, in effect, kept much of the awfulness of slavery still in place under a different name. So, as you rightly know, states have been complicit there on an ongoing basis. I think that the specific question of what state governments ought to be doing now in light of the legacy of slavery is something, you know, I'm not sure I'm the person to comment on in detail. I think that Carson as you rightly note, has long had this view that we should talk about kind of net increase or net decrease in statism. And so the idea can be then that when the state is correcting something that the state itself has done, that can amount to a kind of net decrease in state involvement in in society or state power. I'm concerned, I guess, about the ways in which ongoing state action really, in fact, I think almost never amounts to a net diminution in state involvement in society and in people's lives. Because even when the state is correcting injustice that state action has has been responsible for, you can still easily see an overall kind of solidification and indeed greater legitimation of uh, of state power, right? You can see, you know, if the state, uh, let's say, tries to uh, to make up for the awful injustice that uh, was done to Japanese Americans uh, during World War II, I'd want to say, well, good. I'm glad. I'm glad something happened to provide at least a token uh, compensation for these people who were treated so badly. On the other hand. I see what happened as sort of ongoing evidence of the awfulness of the state, whereas I have the unpleasant feeling that there are a number of people who um, are more inclined to think, oh, well, isn't that just evidence that the system is self-correcting and that indeed the state is getting better? More broadly, it's not just about legitimation, but I do think states continue to grow in power even when they, in one way or another, correct past injustices and can certainly use their correction of those past injustices to attract further loyalty in various ways. And I think if you imagine a large-scale 
state program of reparations for slavery. Again, it's not something about which I'd want to be dogmatic, because I can certainly see the appeal. And obviously, I don't have the view that, let's say, for instance, whenever the state is sued somehow in the current world in which states operate, uh, you know, I certainly think states should be uh, should take responsibility uh, in ways that those those lawsuits involve and, and so forth. So I don't think I could give you a kind of categorical argument against a program of reparations. I'm always uncomfortable with approaches that seem to involve a great increase in actual state involvement in the economy and, and society in one way or another. The temptations that that obviously provides for politicians and for well-connected groups, and also, of course, just the difficulty of teasing out the various dynamics in play today and determining exactly what today you know, is part of that continuing legacy for which a reparations program would be designed to compensate. I think that starts to get very complicated once you get into the weeds, and I think a, a political solution seems to run some risks there. So I'm not, uh, I'm not here certainly saying I think Carson's wrong. I guess I'm just expressing some, some hesitations. Right. Yeah. Political solutions are very complicated and we would have to nuance exactly how that takes place. And that's always the case with the state. I guess additionally, I'd like to say that I agree that from a legal perspective, it seems that those with ill-gotten gains have an imperfect obligation to rectify the situation. Mm -hmm. But it seems that those who have received those goods in an illegitimate way have little incentive to participate in solidaristic redistribution. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I don't, yeah, solidaristic redistribution is an activity of people who are behaving decently mm. in the first place. Rectificatory redistribution is something I think obviously a court or the equivalent is going to uh, demand in one way or another of either the state or those who, uh, you know, are its, uh, its allies and beneficiaries. So, yeah, when I talk about solidaristic redistribution, I don't somehow think that that's going to cover all instances of injustice, and that's not uh, that's not the the uh, illusion that I'm that I'm trying to foster here. Sure, I, sure, yeah. So I completely agree. You're not, you know, people who have already behaved badly are probably, unless they undergo, uh, you know, some kind of you know significant moral change of heart, those people are not going to take advantage uh, on their own of the opportunity to do something about their past inequities. And I hope that rectification effected by a, by a just legal system can, you know, can begin to address those, uh, those difficulties. Mm -hmm. One tool to consider when talking about rectification is direct action. And you gave the example of land theft earlier. Mm -hmm. Given the historical and ongoing injustices associated with land monopoly, What's the correct response to landlordism as it currently exists? And additionally, you mentioned squatting rights in the article. So would tenants be justified in performing, say, universal rent strikes in order to reappropriate housing, effectively redistributing goods back into their hands via direct action? Well, OK, so I'm not a kind of Tucker Ingalls land title person. I think that I think there are, there are reasons to expect that given a set of just property rules and given a situation in which, I don't know, we all, we all arrive on Proxima B as, as colonists, and so there are no prior land titles, but we have decent land rules, I think you'd see various kinds of rental arrangements emerge. And I think if you put Tucker Ingalls rules in place, rules that precluded long-term absentee ownership, You'd find people uh, just developing kludgy workarounds that would that would effectively uh, make that make that happen. Much as we've seen, say, for instance, in the Muslim world, you have this whole complicated system of Islamic finance that's there to deal with the fact that officially interest is ruled out, and yet pretty clearly interest-bearing transactions are very often beneficial to uh, to both parties. So, I don't think you want to just dismiss the idea of rental arrangements. So what we'd have to talk about instead would be, you know, one thing that I've 
argued for 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 a long time is really dramatically reducing the constructive abandonment time period, right? So we typically today have a situation in which to say that property has been been abandoned and not just you know constructively, which is a legal term, but you know it just has been abandoned. You know we often expect that say a, a squatter needs to be there for you know for seven years to occupy property that uh, you know is is sitting there before the squatter can then make a claim to the land. I can I guess imagine why somebody might have thought that made sense in a world in which transportation and communication were profoundly constrained. But I think in our world that's just bizarre. And I would suggest that both because that's bizarre and just as a means of fostering circulation of land in the market, we ought to drop that figure to something like a year. And that uh, occupancy and use uh, would turn out to be decisive in a case in which, uh, you know, again, there are obviously going to be various kinds of complicated exceptions and what it would mean for uh, the previous owner to assert a uh, claim. You know, if I'm, let's say right now I'm in prison and I'm the only person there, well, I, you know, do I have somebody, if somebody goes and, and checks occasionally on my, on my behalf, is that enough? I don't know. We'd have to work out those kinds of details. But I'd certainly want to drop that period for occupancy by squatters. I love the explicit proposal there, by the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that, that's the kind of direction I'd be inclined to go. I think that it's pretty clear that while ex post, a lot of us would be delighted to not have, not have rents to pay uh, and so forth. Ex ante, I think it's pretty clear that an arrangement that essentially eliminated most kinds of, say, residential rents. Obviously, it's a bit different. We're talking about commercial operations. You know, I think, I think we'd find that the practical effect would likely be to dry up the supply in a way that we might find troubling. I think we can all think of contexts in which, you know, I don't want to buy a house. I'm going to be someplace for three months, and I don't want to be an owner there. I want something temporary, and, uh, and that has to work. And I think it's going to be an unduly constrictive arrangement to say, well, the only kind of arrangement of that kind that uh, I might uh, have access to would be one that involved, say, uh, you know, renting an apartment in a structure occupied by the uh, by the owner. So I, I think you know, kind of narrow rules of that kind don't seem to me ultimately helpful. But I love the idea of Number one, tightening the, the period for, for uh, acquiring title by squatting. And then obviously also opening up greater access to land by eliminating state engrossment in ways that I think can be expected to drive down the costs of access to, uh, of access to housing. So what can concerned people do right now to help promote or bring about libertarian redistribution? Well, so probably the area in which people have the most influence is going to be uh, at the level of some kinds of market constraints. Now, I think we're talking about what goes on, you know, at the uh, in the U.S. Let's say at the at the national level. Obviously, very very difficult to to make changes there. But uh, in in state contexts, especially smaller uh, smaller states participating in some cross-ideological coalitions designed to open up even a little of the space uh, closed off by, uh, say, constraints uh, focused on, on licensing or constraints focused on, on land use. I mean, I, I think that would, that's definitely an important place to start. I think one thing we notice with real surprise is that those issues of land use control and licensing are attracting attention from people who are not particularly radical and not particularly libertarian. And I remember when I reviewed a few years ago the book The Captured Economy by Brink Lindsay and Stephen Tellis. Brink is a very moderate libertarian. Uh, Stephen is a, you know, is a liberal Democrat. And uh, the two of them really found, I think, common ground in looking at a range of ways in which as the subtitle of the book says, that, you know, the powerful capture the economy. And those concerns with land use and with licensing, you know, probably not going to be handled with the 
the radicalism that we might like, but I think there is certainly an awareness of difficulties there that means that concerned people ought to be able to get on board with a variety of campaigns that are pretty issue specific, but that they might be able to, uh, you know, support financially or with time or with writing or whatever, often at the state level. I would think, to begin to address some of these. So you think about the way in which an entity like the Institute for Justice has tried to take on some of the state-level licensing rules involving things like hair braiding. And, you know, it ought to be particularly easy to to make these cross-ideological because it's so obvious how many of these arrangements serve to exclude people who are already economically and culturally marginal, uh, you know, often members of, you know, various ethnocultural minority groups. So I think there's something to be said there for looking around for those kinds of campaigns and getting involved in them, looking at, you know, obviously some of these are legislative kinds of issues that might be handled at local or state level. Some are, are you know, litigation strategies that a group like IJ is involved in. I probably start by looking for those kinds of things. All right, so we have one listener question, and then we can go to the actual end of our conversation. Rock and roll, what's the listener question? So the listener question is, you take some punches at consequentialism in the article, but many classical and contemporary anarchists arrive at similar conclusions using consequentialism. If someone agrees with your general political or anti-political goals, what does it matter how they ethically arrive at that position? Yeah. So it seems to me, on the one hand, of course, I want to say, if we agree on a particular uh, goal and a particular strategy, I'm delighted if you think about this in whatever way you uh, are inclined to think about it. And that's fine. It's just that I do really think that consequentialism is a non-starter. I think it it just doesn't get off the ground. It's ultimately, uh, I think, kind of an incoherent notion And uh, so not only does it have problematic consequences as it's kind of normally worked out, but I think it ultimately is just indefensible as an approach to thinking about ethics and law and politics. It's not, when I say it's indefensible, I don't mean that it's bad in some way. I mean that it's finally incoherent. And because it is, I think we need to uh, uh, probably not hitch our, our wagons to that particular star. So, I, you know, obviously not, uh, I'm sure there are many people who won't be at all convinced, especially without a lot more argument than, you know, we're kind of going through here about that. And so if, if those people continue to proceed in broadly consequentialist ways uh, toward uh, anti-state goals, you know, more power to them, obviously. So much work in law and economics is broadly consequentialist. And you think about, uh, you know, really great work, uh, say, by David Friedman, uh, defending anarchism in those terms. Uh, David isn't himself just a consequentialist. He's, you know, his own moral views are more complicated, but that's really the approach that he takes in in much of his work on anarchism. Uh, That's fine. I mean, I get that. And uh, my goal uh, in that uh, essay or elsewhere is not to, you know, kind of just beat up on consequentialists. But I do think if consequentialism is, as I think we should regard it as being a non-starter, then probably we ought to look around for some alternatives. Besides C4SS, where should folks go to learn more about the thinkers and the ideas that have influenced you on this topic? Wow. So certainly I think the folks at C4SS who have been over the years a very uh, fruitful source of of interchange and, you know, really created a unique little intellectual ecosystem uh, that uh, I think we can all be very grateful for. Yeah, apart from that, who's who's been interesting to me? Who's been important? So obviously, uh, I I have to, you know, put in plugs for things I've written. So uh, you want to find out who's influenced me, look in the footnotes to my books. And so I, you know, of course, encourage people uh, on this topic to look at Anarchy and Legal Order, a book that probably in some ways is unduly long and ponderous and probably could be and should be pared down a bit, uh, could be rewritten to to make it more, you know, enjoyably readable, but certainly, uh, you know, it's full of lots of bibliographic information and uh, and so forth. And of course, also the uh, arguably the first and still uh, maybe best uh, C4SS publication, 
Markets, not capitalism, not, of course, published with the C4SS imprint, but created by, by all of us at C4SS, I still think is a, you know, is a wonderful book. If you want to look outside the anarchist space, I, again, probably the people I've been most influenced by, perhaps ironically, are uh, this idiosyncratic group of Aristotelian Thomist uh, philosophers uh, uh, we call the new classical natural law thinkers, none of whom is uh, an anarchist, none of whom is a liberal. And so my own take on kind of uh, an Aristotelian ethics and politics has been, while well, deeply influenced by their ideas, uh, in many ways quite different from theirs. But I think just uh, if you want to sink your teeth into interesting stuff, that group of philosophers, uh, notably, but probably most important, the most important living one being John Finnis is important, you know, I think would, would be well worth uh, your time. Uh, similarly, uh, you know, I can never say enough good things about Alistair McIntyre, even though he also can be infuriating on occasion. So, yeah, I mean, look, uh, my intellectual influences are really eclectic. I'm interested in lots of people and lots of topics, and I hope I've learned from, from many of them. You know, what I've said about, quote, solidaristic redistribution, you know, a person who's talked about that in very helpful ways, not in those terms, probably, is um, Honora O'Neill, a uh, philosopher, uh, English philosopher who's been very interested in issues of global justice, and uh, her single most uh, kind of sustained treatment of these issues is a book called Towards Justice and Virtue from 1996 that I, that I think very well of. It's not, uh, it's Kantian rather than Aristotelian, but it's uh, certainly not very far from uh, the kind of uh, Aristotelian approach I'd want to take. So anyway, lots of, lots of interesting things to, to read and talk about. I'd certainly encourage people want to check out other things I've been up to, to visit my website, garychartier.net, and of course, to, to check in with me uh, directly there or on Facebook, if that's uh, of any interest. Great. Is there anything I forgot to ask you about that you'd like to touch on before we end the interview? Nothing immediately occurs to me, but thanks for asking great questions and being an engaging conversation partner. Yeah, absolutely. Gary Chartier, thank you so much. It's been a blast speaking with you. And yeah, I appreciate you coming on. Absolutely, Joe. All right, we'll talk to you soon. Bye. Cheers.